And so what I'd like to do is to guide you in a meditation and start to, again, deepen in the experience of that middle part of it, the meditation. So putting the view, meaning the philosophy, the understanding of the mind, the path, and so on, all of that study and conceptualization, so to speak, understanding into practice through the second aspect of this triad of view, meditation, and conduct, uh, putting it into practice through meditation, bhavana, or gom in Tibetan. And so let's do that, and then we'll dive more deeply into the writings and some fun teachings on this topic for this chapter. So please go ahead and take a comfortable meditative seat, whether it's upright, on a chair or a cushion, or lying down in supine position, like a shavasana is completely viable. If you like to lie down, you could um, just rest the arms on the floor, but then bend the elbow and bring the forearm perpendicular to the body. The fingers relaxed, everything relaxed, aligned with gravity. And then if you fall asleep, your arm will fall and wake you up. And that's a way to not go into the habitual pattern of sleeping while you're lying down to meditate. Very useful thing to know how to do. Sometimes we find ourselves um, in need of a supine meditative position. Regardless, no matter where you are, what position you're in, make sure the spine is nice and straight, either sitting upright or lying down. And feel the shoulders release away from the ears, the chin slightly draw in towards the chest or the throat, lengthening the back of the neck. There's a nice kind of spacious yet alert wakefulness in the upper body. The face is relaxed. The eyes can be closed to begin as a way to turn inward. The tongue resting at the upper palate, right at the front top teeth. And relax the root of the tongue down towards the heart center. Feel the whole skull, the mind, the brain, the head relax as if the, the bones of the skull, the sutures could release a bit and loosen any tension that's been holding you so-called together throughout the day. See if you can soften and create more space in the cranium. The base of the skull where it meets the occiput, the top of the spine. See if you can breathe the breath into that area of the brainstem. Releasing tension there, all the way circling around to the jaw. You could even let the lower molars release away from the upper molars a bit, the space between the upper and lower back teeth. Breathing through the mouth or the nose is fine. Whatever's comfortable for you. The eyes can be closed or slightly open, gazing at a comfortable angle towards the floor as you wish. Shoulder blades releasing down the back, chest buoyant. Spine nice and natural, an S curve to distribute the weight with gravity. Rooting down into the bowl of the pelvis. Feel the belly soft, belt line relaxed. Releasing tension with the out-breath. Feel any tension melting down into the earth beneath you with the out-breath.
hips, the legs relaxed, feet in a comfortable position, relaxing the ankles, the feet, relaxing the hands, the fingers, the arms soft. The hands can be facing down on the thighs simply. Starting slowly today, first with our intention, our bodhicitta, personal compass. So by setting your motivation at the beginning of practice, it's like charting your course, like having a ballast on a ship. Helps to guide you to your destination. Personal prayer. And the next step is to focus on the breath in a spacious, relaxed way, using the counting method you've learned here or, or not. Just feeling the inflow and the outflow of the breath, the whole field of sensations of the body as you breathe. If you wish, at the top of each breath, you can count. A silent count to yourself, a light touch. <clears throat> And we'll count in silence. We'll practice this in silence. We'll count from one to 21. You can do so as well. And if you forget and drift off, just start again at one. That's fine. Releasing distraction with the out breath. Stay as much at present with the breath as you can.
Now releasing, counting at the breath. And slowly begin to open your eyes a little more if they were closed, gazing at a comfortable angle towards the floor, shifting into settling the mind in its natural state. Let the domain of your attention, your awareness be the space of the mind itself. As if the eyes were soft without any specific focal point. Feel as if you could see into the space of the mind, this field of awareness within which thoughts arise and fall, feelings, impressions, sensory stimuli. As much as possible, feel yourself in a sense kind of leaning back in the experience of a broad panoramic awareness. Shifting from the breath is your focal point to the domain of awareness, the space of the mind as your anchor. And as much as you can, stabilize that. Thoughts are no problem. They arise and pass like birds flying by in the sky of your mind. like a rainbow appearing within space and dissolving, lacking solidity, substantiality. Thoughts come and go. Let this space of the mind pervade thoughts, feelings, sensations, memories. And allow the mind to settle in its natural state like a snow globe no longer shaken, the snow settles to the bottom and the mind becomes limpid and clear.
You notice distraction pulling you away from the moment, from the space of the mind, from your body. Release that distract distraction, the grasping onto thought. Release it, relax, and then return to attending to the domain of the mind, the space of the mind, the arena within which all of these impressions, thoughts, and so on appear and pass away. Stabilize that experience. You get pulled away again. The three R's of release, relax, and return. And settle the mind in its natural state. When in doubt, relax. The eyes grow tired or dry, just rest them by closing them or blinking whenever you need to. And then when you feel ready, you can open the eyes again, gazing at a comfortable angle towards the floor, relaxing the muscles around and behind the eyes. The whole face goes slack. Often it's said that a feeling of awe wash over your face, astonishment, total release. Notice if the chin is jutting forward, draw it back towards the center of the throat, lengthening the back of the neck, relaxing the shoulders down, chest is buoyant. Spine is straight, belly is soft, the breath is natural.
Notice you're lost in thought, grasping your thoughts, memories, and so on. Feel yourself that first R of releasing, like a child releasing a bundle of balloons into the sky. The thoughts just dissipate into space. This letting go, this feeling of utter release and relax into that feeling of spaciousness. And then return to the quality of awareness and stabilize in that space. When you've found that stability of awareness, they say capture the citadel of awareness, meaning that once you have it, don't lose it. See if you can maintain that without gripping or tightening up, but rather with luminosity, with a clarity of mind, <clears throat> stability of shamatha, feeding, nourishing, watering the seeds of your concentration.
Now for the last few <clears throat> minutes of our sit, we'll do some mantra, some chanting to the Buddha of compassion, Avalokiteshvara. A simple six-syllable mantra, Om Mani Padme Hong, Om Jewel in the Heart of the Lotus, Hong. Om and Hong are seed syllables that don't need translation. They're just pointing to the nature of mind and consciousness. Mani means jewel, Padme means in the lotus. This symbolizes our Buddha nature, the jewel in the lotus of the heart. So may our heart lotus bloom as we chant and, and imagine light rays emanating from your heart to all beings everywhere, near and far, friend and foe, to those areas in need, beings, humans, animals, insects in need, and the earth itself and beyond. As you wish, let your intuition guide you as you chant. You can listen for the melody and then when you feel ready, you can join. Oh, mani padme ho, oh, 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 mani padme ho, oh, mani padme ho, oh, mani padme ho, oh, mani padme ho, oh, 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 mani padme ho, oh, mani padme ho, oh, mani padme ho. Oh, mani padme ho, oh, 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 mani padme ho. Oh, mani padme ho, oh, oh, mani padme ho. Oh, mani padme ho, oh, 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 mani padme ho. Oh, mani padme ho, oh, oh, mani padme ho. Oh, mani padme ho, oh, 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 mani padme ho. Oh, mani padme ho, oh, oh, mani padme ho. Oh, mani padme ho, oh, 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 mani padme ho. Oh, mani padme ho, oh, oh, mani padme ho. Oh, mani padme ho, oh, 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 mani padme ho. Oh, mani padme ho, oh, oh, mani padme ho. Oh, mani padme ho, oh, 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 mani padme ho. Oh, mani padme ho, oh, oh, mani padme ho. Oh, mani padme ho, oh, 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 mani padme ho. Oh, mani padme ho, oh, oh, mani padme ho. Oh, mani padme ho, oh, 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 mani padme ho. Oh, mani padme ho, oh, oh, mani padme ho. Oh, mani padme ho, oh, 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 mani padme ho. Oh, mani padme ho, oh, oh, mani padme ho. If you wish, bring your hands together in prayer, symbolizing this jewel in the heart of the lotus by tucking the thumbs into the heart of the palms. Dedicating any positive energy of our practice for the benefit of all beings everywhere. Thank you.
Oh. You know, mantra recitation is considered another technique for shamatha, for cultivating concentration. So if you sometimes find the breath alone or even the domain of the mind, like in settling the mind in its natural state, so subtle for your wily active mind or creative, you could say, mind, try doing man mantra and really staying with the breath, staying with the sound, the prayer behind it, because that's another way to anchor awareness into the present moment. So there are many ways of doing shamatha. I think um, uh, in the Visuddhi Maga, The Path of Purification, this famous book by the great master of um, uh, Buddha Gosa. I think he lays out 40 something, maybe 45, 48 shamatha techniques. <laughs> so it's not just breath awareness. You can stabilize in awareness like we were playing with, with settling the mind in its natural state. Standing, walking, meditation, focusing on seed syllables or statues of the Buddha or other deities, tankas, a mental image. Even with meditating on the breath, especially for the traditions that meditate on the sensations of the nostrils. How many people have experience with that technique, in, mostly in Burma and uh, Thailand? Yeah. Then eventually when concentration really begins to develop more and more subtly, then you, it said you get the acquired sign, which is like a, a little, like a, it's like a, a little ball of light <laughs> at, the, at the apertures of the nostril there. So then that becomes more subtle and the focus becomes that. So I thought I'd just give a little commentary as you're coming out of your own meditative experience. Uh, sometimes it can be quite deep and tender. By all means, you don't have to share or speak, but if you have questions or comments, feel free. Now is a good time. Now it's fresh. Raise your hand or just unmute yourself. I see a request in the room. You can unmute. Um, hi, my name is Tara. I emailed you earlier. Oh, um, hi, Tara. <laughs> um, so it's my first time here, and it's I brought my little sister, and I felt like I followed a bunch of signs that literally brought me right here for an entire year, like literally literal signs. And um, when I was breathing, I felt like sometimes it was hard for me, like, mm. to, like it was a little bit painful when I was sitting up, like to sit straight up in my chest, like that breathing. Mm. And a part of why I'm here is I have a lot of anxiety and I want to be able to let go. And I felt like when I was slouching was when it was more comfortable. And I was wondering if like, that's like okay to like I feel like I want to get to the point where I can like open up my chest and sit up straight and for me I was that was a bit uncomfortable and I was I felt mm -hmm. like I need to close off a bit more um and so that's like what I was experiencing oh, it's, yeah I'm glad you asked that and I've, uh, I look forward to meeting you in person 21 Tara <laughs> um yeah, yeah so I've had gone through phases of the breath awareness actually cultivate like kind of like generating a certain degree of anxiety in my own practice. So I know that's not a rare thing. It happens to people from time to time. Sometimes when we shed light on the breath and suddenly it becomes really like, oh, what's going on in here? <laughs> it's a little too heightened. And then the posture can affect that. So what can be helpful for people is to actually meditate lying down because the breathing apparatus is so relaxed and supported. The spine, the chest is naturally open, the shoulders naturally open to the ground behind you, beneath you. And so the breathing just can be, in a sense, the tensions that can be wrapped up around breathing upright in meditation can just go away or dissolve because it's uh, so much easier to 
breathe lying down. So if I were, you know, if I was aware of that, I would say, just go ahead and lie down and, and do the rest of the practice lying down. Um, yoga is really good for opening the chest and strengthening the back uh, and the core muscles so that you can sit up even in life, but also in meditation with some more ease. Yoga also teaches us how to breathe. So I don't know if you've ever done yoga, but at your age, it'd be a good, good thing to start. You know, start early. It's one of the greatest gifts, I think. Uh, yoga is great. And it really supports meditation, supports the breath, it supports the, all the chest, you know, from, you know, habits of leaning over computers or uh, phones or just, you know, a lot of us have that kind of shortened space here so then the caving in actually feels more natural but it's good to counterbalance that while you're still somewhat young and the spring of your life and get get yourself feeling really comfortable sitting upright and then the back can have its natural s curve where the lumbar is coming in slightly the thoracics the, so lumbar is the bottom part of the spine and the thoracics kind of rounds back where the ribs are the middle spine and then the cervical spine at the neck mirrors the low back. So it makes this natural S curve. And F curves distribute weight much more efficiently than just a straight line. That's why we're shaped that way. And so finding that natural S curve through your own kind of exercise and yoga or whatever it is that you do um, can be really helpful to then feel like, oh, I'm at ease in meditation. You know, I don't have to effort or hold or tense up to hold myself straight or get uncomfortable. Um, yeah, but I'd say just also practice lying down and feel that. And then when you feel comfortable in the anxiety, you know, you're not having an anxiety response, then you can start to ease, do shorter sits where you're sitting up. That was a good long sit, you know, it's about 35 minutes. So it's not easy to do that you know, better to start with shorter sessions, you know, start with five minutes and really feel good with those five minutes. Yeah. Anyone else? No matter how old we are, we always have to learn. <laughs> Sit up, Whew. expand the chest. Sometimes the rib cage can feel tight. So again, lying like with yoga, we teach like lying down on a bolster or a pillow underneath your upper back and, and then lying on it so that the pillow is right under the rib cage. And that naturally opens up the chest. And it, it's this studies have shown that it improves breathing, releases anxiety, calms the mind, simple things like that we can all do at home with our own couch pillows. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Hello. Hi, Chandra. I'm Dean. Yeah, Dean. I um, had a question come up during the meditation, and it was sort of um, a little bit of a, an ironic question because it had to do with the, the problem was the question came up. And um, I was was trying to rest in awareness, and yet, as you were talking about, uh, I relax, return. I forget the other R. Um, release, but, relax, return. Release. Thank you. And I was in sort of in awareness. And then I would have something come into my mind and I thought, okay, release. And then my, maybe, maybe I got all sort of scholastic about it at this point, but I thought, <laughs> uh, well, I'm just awareness. How can I release? Because that's the job of another skanda. <laughs> And I couldn't figure out like, okay, well, is that, can, wouldn't awareness sort of sit back and say, you know, I, I just watch, I'm awareness. That's someone else's job is to release. And would that be, you know, sort of like the fourth 
of the skandhas, the <laughs> intentionality. I I got a little confused, and then <laughs> I thought, okay, but I'm supposed to release this, and yet I couldn't do it. And but but it happened late in the meditation, so it didn't it didn't have any negative effect on me. Any thoughts? No. <laughs> no no i do i'm just saying i'm so yeah i mean awareness is aware it's not like a, a vacuous empty void right so there is i understand your question it's like how can i release if i'm already released you know but see, you're not because you're you're getting pulled in the thought. Even the thought of like release is a thought, and what you're releasing is actually the grasping. It's like the muscle that tightens around the thought when it arises. That's what we're releasing. So it is in a way. I mean, the way I feel it is that yeah, we are in this. We're like we're resting or swimming in this ocean of awareness. But then there'll be little eddies, right? Or a little. I don't know if there are eddies in the ocean, <laughs> the eddies in a river, whatever happens in an ocean where there might be a little swirl and a tightening or a coagulation of, of water. And that's a kind of a thought taking formation into a wave, right? So then the releasing back into the ocean of awareness is that that's what that means. Release, relax, and then, you know, return to that quality of homeostasis, you could say, of Balance. Yeah, I, I see that now. Um, no, but it's a great question. It's, it's like the awareness is is um, sort of like it, it can be like relaxed and open or else it can kind of, like you said, like a, it's a storm or an eddy. Yeah. It, it's a, something kind of, there's a distortion of some kind. Right. I see. I see. Okay. Does that, does that feel good? Can you like that? Yeah. 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 Cause I always go to the five skandhas and um, like I'm yeah. trying to do the sort of separating out because it really benefits me personally when sure. I try to yeah. do that. And so I just got confused in the meditation, but I could see that. Yeah. So the five skandhas of form, feeling, uh, perception, karmic volition, consciousness. consciousness. Yeah. Right. So these are what the Buddha taught to be kind of like the five little rivers that or streams that make up the river of self or the sense of I. And so what, what Dean is saying is that he's going to the you maybe the fourth one where it's the karmic formations, basically thought patterns, your actions based on the karmic formations of prior um, moments and your stream of consciousness. So yeah, that's kind of like classic Buddhism, Buddhist philosophy. And what you're also making me think of is the ahankara, the ahankara, which is an aspect of the consciousness, actually. So there, there are eight consciousnesses. The fifth one, you want me to get Dharma nerdy on you right now? Because I don't have to go Dharma nerd if it's just like, like if I start to lose people. <laughs> but I'm a self-proclaimed Dharma nerd. I don't know a lot about other things, but I know a lot about Dharma. <laughs> and I still have a lot to learn, by the way. So, but the fifth of these five little rivers, these five little streams called the five skandhas, which can mean heap, which is, I think, a, a lame translation. Um, uh, aggregates, which is also not very poetic, but these five aspects of ourselves that make up a sense of I, well, the fifth one is consciousness. And that's more just like, I've got a brain and I'm conscious, just like an, an animal does. It's not like consciousness with a capital C of like, God, you know, it's more like I'm conscious. I'm, I didn't just black out, like I'm conscious. But those have eight aspects. There's the eye consciousness through sight. There's this, you could say taste consciousness through taste, smell consciousness through smell, hearing consciousness through hearing. And uh, tactile through touch but then there are a few more and um, one is the alaya vijnana which is the storehouse consciousness within which all of our karmic formations are housed and then the seventh is the one that i find very interesting which is what i'm getting at which is the eye maker 
the ahankara, which we learn about in the yogic philosophy too. It's a great word. Yeah, it, it means the eye maker, which I love because it's, it's just what you're talking about, Dean. It's that kind of the swirl. It's like we're resting in the ocean of expansiveness, but uh, sometimes it can feel a little overwhelming or boring. And so then the self wants to come in and like do some funky dance to make things more interesting, <laughs> meaning distraction. So that's, that comes about because there's like a grasping, there's this making, there's an eye maker, you're like impulse to like coagulate and create a sense of self and belonging. It's not all bad, but it's just the way it is. So if we can recognize that ahankara, ahankara ing, ahan, ahan means self or, or I, kara means to do, it's the I doer, the I maker which is so cool because, um, because in Tibetan, the word for ego is dak zin, which means self-grasping. That's the word that the early Buddhist scholars decided to translate as ego. It's like the closest thing. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about that too, because the I, the, um, Ducks in the eye grasping, the grasping itself is what we're trying to dissolve and release when we're, when we're meditating. We're not actually like annihilating the ego. We're actually just dissolving the attachment onto the sense of self. And so I, the self grasping in Tibetan, duck, zin, zin means to grasp or to hold, to cling. Duck is self. So the eye grasper, the self grasper. And then the, the Sanskrit word, ahankara, the eye maker, it's like those are verbs or they're nouns, but they're verbs made into noun, nominal verbs. And, um, and so I was thinking, God, it's too bad we don't say it like that in English because have you heard those teachings of like the world and all things are verbs, not nouns? You know, it's, it's kind of like, I believe it's a, more of a Native American understanding of reality. It, we we solidify things into separate things and then we reify those separate things including sense of self but really everything is always in flux so they're verbs not nouns they're an action they're interdependent they're not solidly existing things that's emptiness that's interdependence mm -hmm. and i was thinking oh well we don't really have that in english it's true ego is different i don't know the etymology of ego but then i had this funny little thought of like well, we have the verb go and ego. <laughs> yeah, there's a verbing in that too. We're always going. The ego, ego <clears throat> bike. We could say the ego bike. We're biking around on our ego. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a verb. Ego is a verb. Just if there's anything you remember from tonight, sense of self, ego is a verb, not a noun. We're always changing. We're not these solid things. So that means we have infinite potentiality. We don't have to damn ourselves to hell because we did something wrong. We can say, I'm sorry and have reparations and move on. Right? So it's really fluid and beautiful. Also that has imp implications for gender and identity and, you know, getting stuck in boxes is an illusion and it causes us to suffer. And so uh, my daughter is non-binary and I told them, hey, Dharma is a great <laughs> view, worldview for you. You know, I mean, Dharma is all about breaking out of labels and boxes. And, uh, and they're like, yeah, that's true, actually. They're kind of into it. <laughs> Not that I'm trying to push anything on them. I want them to find it for themselves. But if you're going to have a philosophy to support you in breaking down gender labels and norms associated with those labels, Dharma is pretty supportive for all of that kind of stuff. I mean, that's what the Buddha did. You know, notions of right and wrong, black and white, death and birth are relative truths that are important to respect and understand, but on an ultimate level, they actually don't hold water. They're, they're not ultimately permanent real things. They're relative. What's long compared to the short? Where does that, when does that moment of birth happen? When the baby comes out of the womb? Well, it was already alive in the womb. Well, we don't we need to go all, all the way. Who knows <laughs> where that starts? But that's Thich Nhat Hanh teaches that. Like, when does death 
happen? Is it the signing of the death certificate whenever they said the death happened at the moment of, but you know, there's subtle, subtle states. All of these things are relative. We hold them as so absolute, but they're not. Now, that doesn't mean we don't respect karma and we don't act kindly and have a certain code of ethics so we can respect and love and care for one another. That's where we get into the conduct, the third of these ta gom chu sum, the view meditation conduct, three, sum, is conduct. We act with a reverence and a respect for the interdependence and cause and effect of our actions and so on. And we, we with compassion. Even though everything is interdependent and empty of solidity, we still act with love and compassion. We don't fall into nihilism. Yeah, thank you, Denise. I'll read this. Um, Denise says, such helpful meditation. Okay. She'll return to this recording often. Thank you, Denise. I didn't realize that was a personal note. I hope it was okay that I read that out loud. <laughs> okay, shall we dive into a couple of the quotes in the text? Or does anybody have anything they want to say? I mean, basically, what we're already talking about it, um, or I'm already talking about it <laughs> to you. Um, we are on the chapter of... These three, medit view, meditation, and action, or conduct, chapter 14 of this wonderful book on the path to enlightenment. Claudia, yes. Hi, Chandra. Hi. Um, I, I didn't attend last week's uh, meditation, but I did read uh, chapter 14 and listen to you and Eve on YouTube. And uh, I'm a little confused as far as view. Uh, it, it just stirred up all kinds of questions because I'm wondering, okay, it says that thoughts are unsubstantial. And then I was reading here. Uh, um, Give us the page number so we can follow. Yeah, uh, on page uh, 203, uh, it says, during meditation, keep the mind unobstructed as space. After meditation, regard the flow of events as a rainbow. Thus, the things which so allure the world are seen to be unsubstantial hallucinations. And I guess I have several questions. I, I just, I'm wondering whether, because it says view, meditation, and action. And I'm wondering whether by view, they mean sometimes we have a certain perception that is conditioned by, I don't know, our family of origin, society, whatever, that seem to be pretty solid perceptions. But then when we meditate and of course learn, because it's just also, it's also knowledge, it's not just the meditation, but when we learn, like we are learning with you, um, then I wonder whether that's when those perceptions get transformed or that's where we work on our destructive emotions. That's where we, and that's when these thoughts that we have that seem to be so solid kind of vanish or get transformed. And we realize that, wow, there's no point in grasping, you know, mm -hmm. or clinging to them or whatever. I, yeah. I, I don't know. I'm just thinking about like maybe resentment or anger or, you know, different things. And somewhere it says something about wisdom. And then that translates into our more hopefully skillful action. But I guess my question is, then we shouldn't take ourselves so seriously or we I mean, what is, how does that exactly translate into the real, quote unquote, world, into, into our everyday reality? Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. I'm a little... Like how does the view and meditation translate into the conduct or the action? Um, rather... In a nutshell, I guess. 
Well, I mean, like, are we not supposed to pay any, or take seriously things that are happening in the world? Uh, because like it says here after meditation, it says what? They're hallucinations. Right, right, are right. Are seen to be unsubstantial right. hallucinations. So mm. I, I'm confused. I, yeah. I don't know. To what extent do you, do you take it seriously or not? What's real or what is not? I, I, I don't know. I just, yeah. that kept them yeah. kind of bothering yeah. me. Yeah, no, I think that, when it's time to be serious you know it's time to be serious it's time to you know when somebody's hurt or when there's a war going on for example mm -hmm. you know that's real that's not a rainbow that's real and should be treated uh, with uh, the required you know necessary gravitas so mm -hmm. this isn't making light of reality and and it, what your question is reminding me of a story that I never forgot. I think I've told it a long time ago. I haven't told it recently, <laughs> I don't think, which is that once in Tibet, uh, there was a great Lama who had children. He was a householder Lama and one of them died. And he was so distraught that he, you know, he's crying and crying and crying. And a student said to him, Lama, with all due respect, if we're supposed to view all the events and phenomena as dreamlike and illusory, then how is it that you are so torn up and pained by this passing of your child? And then and the Lama said, well, there are regular phenomena and then there's maha phenomena there's maha events which mean great events like like war like death like tragedy and and the beauty and he said this is a maha illusion this is a maha this is a big one this is a big one and we must uh, let ourselves grieve you know grieve the sadness and respect it and be human now I'm giving some footnotes, but he, he's some commentary too. I'm not sure he said that exact thing, but he did say this is a maha illusion. If everything's illusory, then why are you crying? Well, this is a great illusion. This is something that's so beyond unfathomable and I'm human. And just because like the view is to see things as illusory or impermanent, doesn't mean we go numb to it or we don't take it seriously. In fact, many great teachers say you take things more seriously. You feel things even more greatly because of your non-separateness with all of them. You feel the world as if it was your own body. And in fact, I was reading something and one master said, you know, this is something that maybe we shouldn't tell people when they start off on the path because nobody's going to want to walk the path because it can be very painful the bodhisattva training you know to, to become awake in this life in this body can make us more sensitive more feeling of the world so yes during meditation keep the mind unobstructed as space like we've been doing with settling the mind in its natural state stabilizing in that experience but then after meditation also and during too you could say but regard the flow of events as a rainbow in the sense of like rainbows appear in what they appear in the space of the sky mm -hmm. the space of the sky is an analogy for the space of our mind mm -hmm. awareness thoughts feelings impressions they appear within the space of the mind much like a, a rainbow appears it appears yet it lacks a substantial solid reality Right? Do you understand? Mm -hmm. your, your thoughts, they appear, but they're like, if we peeled back this, the skull, we couldn't find the thought. It's not a solidly existing material thing. Um, so thus, the things which so allure the world, meaning allure us, oh, I want this, I want to buy that, oh, popularity, oh, money, fame, all of those alluring things in the world, 
should also be seen to be in substantial hallucinations, just like the rainbow. So that doesn't mean a thought of, I want to go to grad school and become a doctor shouldn't be taken seriously. I can see that as a thought and then I can really investigate. Is that a thought worth taking <laughs> seriously? You know, so it's a thought. It's not the real thing. But what is the real thing of the doctorate? That isn't like a hallucination. Is, is, is it on this? Is it the certificate on the wall? Is it the seven years you've put in, the money you've paid? Is it the institution? Is it the hat you get at the end? What is it? There is no thing called a doctorate. <laughs> it's a label like a hallucination we think it's real but it's actually uh, like the skandhas coming together to create this temporary moment of something that we really think is real but when we peel behind the curtain we see oh it's a confluence of many different things coming together that creates this definition of a doctorate degree for example and all of that came from a thought so yeah did you see yeah, you I mean, supposedly in the, when we settle our mind in this natural state, there's supposed to be clarity, right? Do yeah. you think it's a good idea, for example, to ask a question, but then release it mm -hmm. and then just let yeah. whatever pops up? Yeah, that's actually and, a technique that that's used, actually. Yeah. It's, it's happened to me, but, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was just wondering if that's also kind of a way of being more in touch with ourselves and kind of like transforming and working mm -hmm. on things, but just letting the subconscious or the whatever, the clarity of the mind to emerge from yes. that, from that very serene space. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's a common technique. And so you're onto something really good, Claudia the what often is taught is to look for the source of thought like so you then would intentionally think of a thought whatever thought you wanted to you know, who am i <laughs> or uh, purple elephant you know it can be a question or it can just be an image mm -hmm. and then observe that arise within the space, pass, and then dissolve. And so some te techniques say, seek out the source, the origin of a thought. And then once it's arisen, release it. Seek out, no, not yet. Seek oh. out the location. Well, where does it abide when it's still hovering in the space of your mind while it's still here with you? Oh. Can you find it? And then finally, the third part, seek out the destination. Where does it go when it passes? Hmm. The source, location, and destination. This three-part inquiry to any thought. Like I said, it can be purple elephant. It could be who am I? It can be, you know, Claudia. Sense of I. Where is it? If we're suffering, it can be where is my suffering? You know, with sincerity, find it. Is it in my heart? Is it, when it arises, where is it? Can I label it? Can I find a specific place for it? We're not, we don't have any agenda. We're just looking. And, but I will tell you that in the teachings, it says pretty soon after it introduces the technique, it'll say, it'll kind of help you along because, yeah, it'll say, you may find that there is no, you know, the thoughts, they arise, but they come from nowhere. They abide, but they abide nowhere. They dissolve, but they dissolve to nowhere. Like mm -hmm. they, they appear, but they're empty of a concrete source, location, and destination. Mm -hmm. And in that, you pop open into that deeper sense of self expression of awareness, and then you can abide in that. It's like a, it's kind of like a koan, you know, koans are used to kind of tri trip the mind into a state of realization. So you learn through the experience of it, not necessarily through getting an answer. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, very good. Mm. Yeah, Jonathan writes in, my spiritual teacher says that compassion is love in action and that love is the fragrance of enlightenment. It must act. Is your, is your teacher Amaji? Yeah. Oh, it's so beautiful. What How did you guess? 
because I was just writing about Amaji. She's my 15th Tara. Oh, and I so love nice. that quote. I love that quote. Yeah. So there's something like that in, in the book I was reading. Yeah, she definitely does. And she says that like all of her actions, I mean, she gets like maybe two hours of sleep a night and is just constantly love and service. And for her, it's just, a, it's like a river. It just has to flow. She has no choice. And um, people ask her if she gets tired and she's like, no, love has to flow. It mm. has to do what it does. It doesn't have any choice. The river has to keep going. So, and I think that, I mean, her question was like, can we see everything is illusionary? You can, but then it's also like the fragrance of enlightenment has to do what it does. Mm -hmm. it mm, has definitely. To. definitely. Yeah, good, good. For sure. Beautiful. This, because Claudia, yeah, I mean, anybody else want, that's so beautiful, Jonathan. Thank you for sharing. We can't forget the compassion is love and action. And that's the action. That's the chirpa, the third of the three, right? So it's like the sun and its rays, you know, the sun's shining. The rays are the love. It's got to manifest. You can't stop it. It's yeah. creative display, the effulgence of the natural luminosity and the benevolence of our true nature. So she's tapped into it, Mamaji. She's there's no gates or no blocks there. It's open. It opened at a young age. Yeah, for her. This poem is so nice that you, it's a it's um, a little ahead of where I was going to go, but I'm thinking. Um, Maybe I'll go back to what I wanted to read and then maybe we'll pop forward or you can do this one next time. But back on 197, I love this, this short paragraph by Dilgo Kense Rinpoche um, in the middle of the page of 197. It speaks to what we're talking about here. He says, all phenomena arise from emptiness through the illusory play of causes and conditions. And it is precisely their empty nature that allows all things to manifest. And when you hear empty, think interdependent. Okay, that can, it's a synonym. It's the other side of the coin. Remember last week we talked about that. So it's their interdependent empty nature, you could say, that allows all things to manifest. Just as space enables the totality of the universe to unfold without itself being altered or affected in any way, or just as the sky makes possible the appearance of a rainbow, phenomena are the adornment of emptiness, but emptiness is never tainted by them. Mm. So that's the analogy of the mind. And please know that when we say empty, we're not saying void, vacuous, stale, stark. Okay, we're saying it's a warm, fuzzy, interdependent, vibratory, akashic field of bliss love <laughs> it's my uh, long qualifying statement to the word shunyata emptiness so let's hop forward to the the poem that um claudia read there at the top of 203 because that's so beautiful so we'll re I'll read the first stanza aloud to you because it's, it's deep, and then I'll read the next two. This is the seventh Dalai Lama, seven Dalai Lamas ago. It's one of the great one of the great Dalai Lamas. Kalsen Gyatso. During meditation, keep the mind unobstructed as space. After meditation, regard the flow of events as a rainbow. Thus, the things which so allure the world are seen to be insubstantial hallucination. So hallucination is an interesting um, translation, by the way. All of this is translated, right? So you're kind of at, a, unless you know the root language, you're on, on the, at the whim of the translator. But the, um, the Tibetan word is trul, trul, T-R-U-L. And it means like a magical display or illusion. But the translator, Matthew Ricard, decided to say hallucination. 
And so it's nice to know a little bit more nuance to the word. We don't have to get fixated on, oh, it's hallucinatory, like a psychedelic trip. It's actually we're seeing things like a mirage, like a magical display or an illusion. Then he says, joy, uh, somebody's not muted. And I'm hearing some noise. Maybe it's quite that was a... Oh, that's just you. OK. Okay, so uh, joy and misery are dances within a dream. Forms and sights are a town projected by a magician. Sounds are like one's own voice echoed in a cave. Those who grasp at them are mindless children. Just as a reflected image distinctly appears when a man holds his face to a mirror, all things are both radiantly manifest and empty. For that very reason is cause and effect unfailing. So that because cause and effect, meaning karma, is unfailing, meaning you can't get out of it, it's happening. It, without, a fit, without failing, it arises and passes. That because for that very reason, is cause and effect and failing. So all things are both radiantly manifest and empty. So it's like they're appearing, but they're empty. And because of that co-arising, a phenomena, interdependence of phenomena, they are empty of solidity and separateness. And therefore we have to respect karma. So I want you to understand another thing about emptiness. So we mustn't reify emptiness as a thing. Emptiness is empty. Emptiness is actually, it's not a thing. It's a quality of perception. It's a quality of phenomena. You understand? Emptiness is a quality of phenomena in the way that wetness is a quality of water. So when you hear emptiness, don't reify it as this, this thing way out there in the sky that we're uh, trying to understand or, or um, work towards. That's a mistake. They say actually people who reify emptiness are even worse off than like cows. <laughs> There's an old saying, there's an old saying, so it goes something like, you know, the fools who, who believe in permanence are, uh, I don't know, fools or whatever. And then the, the people who reify emptiness are even more foolish, you know? So we, I, please, emptiness it could be a verb. It could be, it's, but it's actually, a, it's like an ad, it's like a adjective. Emptiness qualifies whatever, everything. The light, shunyata. The computer, shunyata. Ta is ness, and shunya is empty. So just think of the relationship wetness to water, right? Emptiness is a quality of phenomena of all of our perceptions, outer and inner perceptions have that quality of emptiness, just like water has a quality of wetness. Does that help us not reify emptiness as a thing? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, we are almost at time. I'd love to hear any more voices or comments. How does that land with you? You know, how, how it, you know, the thing is, is that the Buddhism is kind of guilty of being kind of a stark religion sometimes, but it's not. It's, it's compassion. Like Amaji, Amaji is a bodhisattva. Really, the good Buddhists, the good teachers uh, are the ones who really focus on compassion. And the thing that's useful about the teachings on interdependence and emptiness is that it shows us that we're not separate from each other. And just like I don't want to be free of suffering, I recognize that you don't either and that I, should, I can have compassion. 
uh, for others in the same way that I would hopefully have compassion for myself, or maybe the other way around. Maybe I should have some compassion for myself in the same way I have compassion for others. That's actually a bit more true for me. I remember once my best friend said, Chandra, if you could just love yourself the way that you love others, that would probably feel really good. <laughs> I was like, oh, right. I'm hard on myself. I think a lot of us are. Some of us are kind of the opposite of what these old Buddhist teachings say. Of like, oh, we tend to, we love and cherish ourselves, but we're so mean and, you know, discarding of others. But a lot of us, it's kind of the opposite. It's easier to love others and it's harder to love ourselves. So some might resonate with that, some might not, but um, we're all interdependent. So let's have compassion for each other, but also for one, for ourselves. Um, you know, we're all, we're all doing our best here, especially in these day, these days, this day and age is, I don't know about you, but it's the hardest time in my life, you know, whether it's the outer reality or the inner reality, there's a lot going on for a lot of us. And it's good to remember to be compassionate and patient with each other. So um, that's the respecting karma, that's love and action, that's compassion. And that's really the, the, chu, the action or conduct of the third of the three. So the view is to understand karma and emptiness and interdependence. Meditation is to steepen that and really make it your own and develop compassion and wisdom. And then conduct is what you do when you get up off your cushion. Integrate that wisdom. Bring that to fruition through your actions, your speech, both internal speech and external speech and so on. So that's in a nutshell. It's, it's all cycling. It's not linear. And we go back to view, more study, more thinking, more what is the map of this terrain, understanding the perspective, more meditation, more contemplation, cultivation, familiarization, and then more out in the world. Here we go again. You know, it's always cycling. So thank you, everybody. Stay connected. Give if you can give. The center really needs our support now more than ever. And uh, may you be well. Eve will be with you for the next two weeks. And then I just wanted to remind you that I, um, I'm going to be traveling and teaching for June and half of July. So Eve will hold, hold down the fort for most of that time. And uh, we'll, we'll get a, a one or two high quality subs for you when she can't make it. But please try to come and support uh, the center. And uh, we look forward to seeing you May 21st. And I think I'll see you at least one more time, apart from the grand opening celebration. Um, I think I'll be able to teach one more class. So stay in touch, everybody. Take care. Be well. Thank you, SFDC, in person and online everywhere. May all beings be happy. May all beings be free from suffering. And may they taste the, the nectar of their own true nature. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chandra. Yeah, thank you.